I went home and when I said I went home, maybe someone think like, oh, he can uh, take his family, go everywhere. No, when I go home, I stay in my room with my AK, my grenade, ready to kill in the front of my kids. And this is the hardest things in our shoulder as parents to, to face ugly, savage things with the same response and reaction. So I'm sitting, do nothing, drink, and I saw my kids, they have nothing. No life, no school, no dream. And, and include all that, they hear that their dad is a traitor. He's a piece of shit. And they cannot say anything. They cannot feel happy in front of me when they saw me. I didn't share them what I did. But they don't want to like brag, oh, dad, he come and he brings some gift or something because they care about my life. So they kill my kids. Happiness, smile, those savages. And I end up with this like, I think I'm so fucking selfish. This is 2006. From 2003, I'm fighting. I'm putting my life every day without asking anything a reward. for my country. And I think it's time to fucking more, more than my country is to my family. I did my part. And that's why when I head back from my vacation, I went to Steve Wozowski. And I don't know if he told you the story or not. I went to Steve Wozowski, his captain. Uh, retired now. I told him, brother, I need to move from Iraq to United States. I'm done. And this is why. I want to restore my kids' dream. I want to restore my kids' honor. I want my kids to be proud when they mention my name. Welcome to the Transition Drill Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Pantiani. I appreciate you taking the time to watch. So let's get into this. It's definitely a small world in that. So my tactical team was just up at the Cato Conference oh, in Reno. Yeah. But I didn't get to go because we, we split the team in half and oh, half the okay. team went up there. And then it turns out that you were up there presenting. Yep. Yep. Uh, I meant to amazing guys like uh, one of them in Riverside Neck the sergeant uh, Toby uh, Mark uh, Marcus and it's funny you saw those people they want to succeed the events and the same time they face death every day correct they just want to send the right message and this flexibility give you feeling like you deal with warrior. You know what I mean? You are not dealing with demons. Because sometimes, you know, when you reach to the position, you start feeling comfortable and you start follow your greedy. Those people, humble, they just want to do the right things, funny, all about life. So it's amazing. Have you presented at Cato before or was yeah. this the first time? No, second time. Okay. And I think it's going to be like kind of traditional to present them every year. Uh, next time it's going to be in San Diego. Hopefully can I come and enjoy? I'm hoping so. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately from the, the, uh, this side of the house, budgets always become a problem. Of course. And when you've got, you know, a 20 man team, it's hard to send all 20 people. No, it, it just no, becomes no. a dollar yeah. dollars issue. Dollar issue, and just in case you guys need something here. Of, of course. You cannot, yeah. I don't, I want to talk about your book, but I don't want to make it just 
page after page after page after your book because I want people who haven't read it to read it. It's a, it's an amazing book, but I, I really want to kind of dig more into you as a person and kind of work through the kind of work through the book in the podcast. And so obviously you're from Iraq, grew up in Mosul. Correct. And my, my first question was, or is. Are we start now or not yet? Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> um, my first question is, as a young boy growing up, you mentioned in the book how your family wasn't, you're, you're Muslim and you're Sunni, but you weren't um, going to church or, or, or mosque wasn't a regular thing for your family. Was that kind of normal for most families at that time when you were growing up? Yeah. I mean, like 90% of the families, they are more relaxing with religion. They are not extreme with the religion. They have to go to the mosque. They have to do this and that because, you know, we have five times prior in each day. I mean, you guys easy one day in a week. <laughs> <laughs> so my family and a lot of family, they don't go to the mosque maybe every month, every two months, maybe every week. And it's kind of modern religion. And this is what my parents teach me, to accept the religion as something can develop our human inside us, not something to be slave for. Right. And this is where we lose the goal of religion. And, but even though you, they didn't go to mosque frequently, they still adhered to the five prayers per day? Depend on your house location. Okay. Sometime if you're close to the mosque, yeah. Sometime if you don't, you don't hear it. And your family in general, you were one of six children? Three sisters, three brothers. And you're not the youngest, but close to the younger? Uh, the last one to youngest. Okay. Yeah. And what did your father do for a living? He is sergeant in Iraqi army before. After that, he is uh, running, like buying, selling cars, doing uh, taxi, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And in the book, you mentioned that you were a, a respected family and, and probably what I would equal to middle class. Kind of middle class in that time. Yeah. And what was life like for you at that time? I, well, what took up your daily life? Uh, I mean, in that time, uh, compared to my age, it's basic life in any place in the world. Game, fun, and that's it. And for me, like me and billion kids, I have a few dreams. And one of the dreams is to be a warrior. And to change the world, to be with the good people, fighting bad people. And that's being said, every time years pass through, my understanding of warriors start getting changed. But the funny things on that, I kept my dream to be a warrior and I translated to uh, getting slingshot and establish my own uh, army and start attacking another neighbor, consider them kingdoms. And I remember one time I broke a lot of windows, white <laughs> light. And I remember one time they took me hostage and this looked like they put me in the wall and there was like line of my enemies. They line up, it looked like Nazi. <laughs> uh, with a slingshot and they start like heading me and I mean it's, it's pain for perspective though these are just other young teenage boys yep, yep from okay. different neighborhood so you know like the animals they he mark his territory yeah same thing with us I mean this is like basic to a degree almost maybe like a street gang yeah yeah but not like right right now the ga gang right I mean, it's childish gang, just to prove yourself, your size, you know what I mean? And this is my dream, but my dream will bring a lot of issue to my family. 
a lot of trouble. <laughs> and it's kind of, we end up like I have serious conversation with my dad. And my dad, he, we have a unique relationship, me and my, my dad, my, uh, my mom, they love me. And they says, son, this is not the right things to do. And this is what we get. And we kind of peaceful. And this is not our path. And I told him, I, I know that. And 100%, but I cannot stop myself. So him and mom, they try to think about solution. As any parents, they do to save their kids. And they comes up with, send me with my cousin. He's a basketball player in the Iraqi national team. And well-known, famous. I know him. When I go with him, people, they shake his hand. And, you know, the, in that time, there's no social, no social media. But still, people, they know him. And they love his character. And when they told me, he's like, yeah, fuck yeah, I want to do that. But there's no fuck yeah. We don't need this. <laughs> <laughs> so I went with him. And it's kind of classy club, sport club. I went with him with my slingshot hang in my neck, no sandal, no shoes, nothing. Walking with him, went inside the club and he says, oh, do you see the, the guys, they uh, play basket? Go play with them. I'm like, okay. Same thing here. I mean, in everywhere. When you go, you are strange and you try to play or something, you will find few people, they push you away. So anyway, I succeed kind of, and I start play basket. Not to play, I start join them because I have no idea, no trouble, nothing. And so you had never played basketball before no, then. No, and this is like twelve, thirteen years old, and this take me in so embarrassment, personal. Like when they pass me and they do a score, and I cannot stop them because they have. Awesome fake, you know, with the body. So I started to use my skill, which is cap skill, not cap <laughs> skill, but cap speed. And there is like three big dudes, they passed off because I had one of them and I throw him in the ground and everyone like start laughing on him and they came and they start beat me. So I, you know, I took away my slingshot from my neck and I started doing my business. The right there on the basketball am, court. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> the business I know, you know. And those guys, they start run away. I beat them so bad. And the club, the, the club boss, he came and he kicked me away. And he says, I don't want to see your face again. He's so mad because those guys, they bloody... So anyway, I went back home and I'm, I feel so disappointed because this is the only thing I love beside my violent. And I want to learn, I want to play. But those guys, they come and they block my destiny, you know what I mean? And the other issue, I have to face my family. I don't want to disappoint them. I went back home and I saw my cousin and he said, oh, you come early. I told him, yeah, this is what happened. He says, oh, don't worry, I will fix it. So next day he take me with him. As I told you, he is uh, uh, famous basketball and the kids, they love him and came, hey, this is my cousin, took care of him. I apologize for what happened yesterday and hey, let me play with you. So he kind of built understanding relationship a bridge between me and them. Uh, it looks like I'm redneck coming to rich people. Right. You know what I mean? So they accept me. Not because they like me, but because... Your cousin. Cousin. And I start playing basketball, and I forget completely about the violent, the going to other, another neighbor. It's my, like, my, all my life focus is how I play basketball, how I do. 
uh, different skills, how I practice, how I develop my skill, how I do that, how I do this. And this has became my life. And, you know, at that time, we don't have, like, cell phones. You just pull your right. cell phone. Oh, let me do this or let me do that. So you have to watch. We have a sport program. Because this is the middle 70s? It's, uh, end of 70s. Okay. To beginning of 80s. Okay. And we have to wait all the week to uh, watch the program, sport the program, uh, they called sport in a week sport in one week and on tv on tv so we had the same thing back then it was called wide world of sports and it was one day a week and yeah. they would wrap up everything that everything. happened all, that week. all the sport and they show you and part of that always they uh they show harlem team the harlem globetrotters yeah oh, okay i love it the way how they do things and i just like you know, we don't have a recorder, we don't have anything, but I just like focus 100% to see one of the movements so I can copy it, practice, and do it. And this is kind of different path of my dream when I am like five, six, seven, eight to be a warrior, change the world, right? Now I'm playing basketball. But this path take me without planning to be a warrior bolt in different level or from different window if i can if i can use that which is you play basketball you are a harlem team it's like chain you have to watch cowboy movies cowboy movies john wayne with the, all the freedom practicing in every movement, fighting for his right, uh, protecting innocent people uh, against gang or whatever, you know. Next step, you have to listen to country music. <laughs> you have to listen to Kenny Roger. Ladies, there are so many ways I want to say is I love you. And you have to have imagination to sit on the mountain in the front of the leg and the blonde girl next to you. And this is me building that dream. I didn't know they call it American dream. But those pieces build the dream in my mind. I will live in the United States if I have one day left in my life. So even as a young boy, you thought there would yeah. be a day that you would be here in America? Yes. I promised myself, last day of my life, I will live in the United States. And was it at that time because of just what you saw on the screen and it seemed like a place that, I, I, did it seem better than where you were at? Or what was the draw to want to be in America? Uh... I mean, if you look at it to my age that time and my dream and my understanding, different than now. Correct. And this is, if you we cannot compare it. Same thing if I ask you about your dream when you are 10, 13, 12, compared to right now, you just want to leave it alone. It's like, this is a unique dream. I want to leave it alone. But when you're getting old and you take all the small details, it's kind of make me make you feel like, no shit, I'm proud to build that dream as foundation of my life. Because the job I took it with SEALs and Special Forces make me deal with the worst level of a human the ugly level of a human, savage level of a human. And you have to think like them. You have to deal like them. You have to plan like them. If you want to protect the dream for the new generation. Right. And I think 
Yeah, the dream, I dream about it. I think the result is satisfied me. I just say that, so obviously my experience growing up in America, and I, and I think back to when I was 13, 14, 15, and, and my, my scope of the world and, and what I thought was out there was very small. And to, to, for me, my life was about riding my skateboard and what I was going to watch on TV, which sounds almost a lot like exactly what you were doing. But I had never, it never at any point when I was a young boy thought I would live somewhere else. Because there is no other American dream. There is only one American dream and you live on it. But well, I don't. And that's what I'm getting at. Was what in Iraq at that time, what did you see as missing that was offered here in America? I, I know that you talked about the blondes and the, and the music and the TV, but what else did you feel was kind of missing? The way of life, the freedom, free religion, free opinion, uh, the culture, the tradition. Don't get me wrong. There is a lot of good things in Iraq in that time. You know what I mean? But it's like this is advance. United States is advance of freedom for everyone, no matter where he live. So this is what I missed. And as you know, in all Middle East, there is always struggling with politic, greedy politic, politic with agenda, uh, and we we are very well of building dictatorship by kiss their ass, not to practice our our freedom, not saying the right things, all these kind of things. So I think. For a future vision, I feel the American dream serves my agenda. Serve, not my agenda, serve my human need. So my limited knowledge of the history of Iraq, Saddam came into power or control late 79, 1980, I believe. 79, yeah. You were at that point... How old? Like 15-ish. Could you at that time see, was there a noticeable change in your country when he took control? I didn't notice anything, but the big difference happened when we have war against Iran. And now, no matter who is right, who is wrong, there is million innocent people from both sides killed, not from politic, killed. The things make me like think seriously, this is not going right. The end of this thing is gonna be disaster is one time in 1982, I saw dead body came to our city of Mosul, which is weird, like do you see dead body like killed in war and the awkward things that's the mili- Iraqi military police who escorted the body to the family they asked him to pay him the money for the round they killed their son the money for the bullet wow because the story is behind that this teenager, 19 years old, he never saw the war, and they push him to the front line. Like training, like belief, like faith, like whatever you call it. He just ran away. He's scared in his life after his company being killed. And there is assassination line behind the front line. And when he's coming, they kill him. Iraq. So uh, Iraqi military would kill their own if they were turning around to run away. Yeah. And they took body to his family and they asked him to pay the money for the round, kill their son. When I saw that, I was like, wow, this is not good. We are going to chaos. And from that time, I started thinking different. 
about politics, about Saddam's, and that's why I never, when he came visit my city, I never went to him or college him or I mean, I'm small piece. Right. It's not going to make any different, but it's going to make different for me to self respect, to not support someone who is just build his own glory in innocent people. Was there any blowback on you for not going to visit him? Did other people look at you as not supporting him? Or did they not really pay attention? They don't pay attention. And also when we talk, I don't express my opinion. Because if I express it, they will, they will kill me. Got it. I, I remember one time, my cousin, just to let you know our system, how it work. Our cousin, he's a, uh, he bring a generator from Baghdad to Mosul. I think he want to smuggle it to Kurdistan. I think. Just to sell it? Yeah. And smuggling, it looks like you smuggle it across the border. It's not legal. Right. You know what I mean? But still in Mosul, it's legal. The intelligence, they came, the security. Uh, they came and they captured me, my cousin, his kids, and they took us to a, a security building. And they start torturing us. Four days. I remember they called Falaka, which is, they took your legs up and they put the stick underneath it and they hit it with a stick. And I never have this kind of things. And you know, my, my foundation, I am leaders. (laughs) You like to fight. (laughs) Yeah. And now I am in position. I cannot defend myself or I cannot restore my honor. It's pissed me off so bad. Uh, So imagine this kind of small things. We've been three days on the jail, small jail, maybe like this size, 60 people on it, for just, they think. That the the generator was going to get it um, smuggled. So how about if you talk about the president? You can't imagine and when they finally let you go, it's you're basically in a position that you can't talk negatively about it once you're out. You just have to put let it did, in the past let, and let move. Let it go. In, in your home, so you've been in the United States now for over a decade. And we are very vocal about our politics in this country, both outside and inside our home. Inside your home growing up where your parents vocal about their dislike anything or was even your family just kind of like we just don't talk about it we kind of talk about it but with a lot of promising and warning be careful don't say anything this and that because especially after 1990 when saddam's decided to take kuwait if he's he's right or wrong i'm not discuss that matter but i've discussed about the iraqi people we start struggling because of the sanction. At the same time, him and his family, they eat everything they want. We did not have candy for 10 years. We did not have cake. We did not have soda. We, do, we don't know something called banana. So all this struggling, people, they talk, but they don't talk on the street everyone know there is something like right now what's going on now yes we have the freedom to talk in and outside but right now people they pissed off from politics more than any time in the united states time people they talk you sit with taxi driver he start talking about gas you sit with police he's talking about defend the police you took with te- you sit with teacher. He talk about his house rent four thousand, and he make four thousand five hundred. So my point is, people now in the United States they talk, and when they talk, they build the foundation for big change. So same thing with us. 
And that's why when the United States came to Iraq to liberate Iraq, I don't want to use invade Iraq, to liberate Iraq, no one fight them back because no one believe Saddam's, he present Iraq. Everyone believes Saddam, he came to kill Iraqis. Now, if you compare it with the new politics, Saddam's way better than them because the chaos and the agenda they brought from outside Iraq. And this is a different section of discussion. Right. I want to take a step back real quick. I want to go back to, so you're, you're a young teenager, you're playing basketball. Were your dreams to use basketball to, to further your life? Were you hoping to, to play for the, na- the Iraqi national team? Did you have goals for college or anything? So when I played basketball, at the same time, one of the coach, he says, hey, did you try to um, play high jump? It's like, no. He says, you want to try it? It's like, yeah. I th- no, this is a um, high school sport coach. He says, hey, do you want to go to the championship for schools, district in Mosul City and do high jump? And if you win first, second, third, I will pay you money. It's like, okay, I'll do it. So I went and I went the first in Mosul district. And they moved me to Mosul District team. And I went in all Iraq. I jumped nine, uh, one meter, 91 centimeters, which is almost like same, same high. Okay. And they took me to the youth, Iraq youth uh, team. And the coach, he's from Baghdad. And I made 100, uh, one meter, 95. And I make 100, one meter, 96, 97, 98, 90, two meters. And I am before 20s. And the coach, he took another guy who make 185 to the Asian championship in Jakarta and he didn't take me. And because I didn't kiss his ass. I was going to say. I kind of, I beat him. <laughs> yeah. Because on the training, he don't focus on me. He focused on that guy, which is his dad. He's like an Iraqi general rank. And he just ignored me. So, so it like, wasn't about what was best for the team. It yeah. was best for him as a coach and what benefit he got. So imagine the corrupt. Yeah. And so when I play that game, this is kind of became my key to run away, escape from Iraq. But after I beat the coach, they kicked me away from Iraqi national team for youth and they never have chance to go outside of Iraq. And were you already really tall at, 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 as a young man? Yeah. Compared to other k- kids your age? I am were, gi- giant. Okay. Yeah. So you were... You in, my, in my country, my highest is giant. Over here, I'm normal. And your cousin who played basketball, was he really tall also? He's a little bit shorter than me. Okay. Maybe like two, three centimeters. Yeah. Did you think about going back to basketball after the high jumping? I play with high jump uh, basketball just for fun. Oh, okay. Because it's fun and, you know, my dream, my everything. But the high jump has kind of became my career. But basketball and high jump is not to bring any money for me. And I became like, you know, adult and I need to make my own money. So even like with your, your cousin who was part of the national team, that was not his job? No. Oh, yeah. okay. And no, my cousin, they pay him. Okay. But they don't pay him a lot. Like, look at to NBA. Of course. You know what I mean? Uh, they pay him just to survive. We don't have the same process that we have it in the United States for sport, any sport. Like, you're, if you are in high school, they pay your scholarship, they commercial, they pay you money, you will have comfortable life. 
Like when I play high jump, I used to, I have to eat meat, white meat, fish. And I told you like in, after 1990, we have sanction, family struggling and they killed the middle class. Like right now what happened? And I eat like maybe soup of meat or chicken or whatever every week one time. Right. So you weren't getting the proper nutrition no. to advance your, no. your, your athletic career. And this is not only me. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Did you ever think about going to college? No, I didn't. I mean, I try, but it's like, ah, oh, fuck it. I'm not on that. And in Iraq, if you could not go to college, you had to go to the military? Yes. It's not optional. I keep pushing it full. Go ahead, go ahead take it, finish taking the drink and then. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. So I um, keep pushing it for almost three years, but I feel to give any more excuses after I uh, finish and they took me to military and I started, you know, because I am athletic and I start training uh, the army units and I spent like two and a half, three years and I released. And at that time I met my wife, which is the second, I told you I have a few dreams. First dream, uh, basketball and the American dream window to be warrior. And second dream is my wife. Uh, it's long love story, beautiful until now. And when I married her, it's put extra responsibility I have to bring money. So I started find work to bring extra money to my home and I quit playing basketball or high jump. The, the story of, of how you, let's say, um, pushed away some other man who was trying to marry your wife is, <laughs> is interesting. If you'd like to tell that story. Yeah, of course. So the thing is with, uh, my wife, she live in, in, um, in, in my tribe neighborhood, like, this is her house and end street. Uh, the two houses at the end is my uncle and my cousin. So, you know, I'm visiting them and I saw them by an accident and love story from first look. For you, not for her. She, for wasn't, in, she yeah. wasn't interested no, in you right no. away. And after like, we kind of getting each other feeling and love and yeah, bring a lot of uh, joy and pleasure and smile. Uh, we decide like, no shit, she's my woman, you know? And I try to uh, engage her and I told my family and my family, they love it. And one time I'm sitting in my house, like 15 minutes away, destination from my, my wife house. My cousin called me and he says, hey, there is Iraqi general came and asked Beida hand from her family. It's like, what are you fucking talking about? It's like, yeah. So in Iraq and Arabic countries, some of them, we have kind of rules. If you want to marry your cousin, you can put rule on it and you will say, this is mine and no one can come to it. But she is not my cousin. She is from different tribe. I told him, she is mine, no one come. How he dare and come. He says, okay, we just let you know. And I remember I had pistol 14 Browning. I put it and I have nine, nine round and pulled the trigger and they went there. And my point is to kill him, not to talk. So I went there and I went to my cousin, but you know, when you walk to the mission, you, you bumps up <laughs> and 
for me is like this is all what is mad at now my dream going away and no one can take it if i do anything i'll do it i went inside because he was an older man right back old yeah but he's an iraqi general and i went back i necked the door i went to the end of the road and they know i am here so they start talk oh riyadh he's here blah 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 and he's kind of like you can tell he's angry and no one opened the door i went again and i knocked the door and from a lot of people inside the house i saw my wife she's kind of look at to me and this looks like you know you, you play this game <laughs> She want me to save her, you know what I mean? You live that role, you know? It's like, fuck it, I have to do something. So I told him, I want to talk with him. So soon he come and I just start like fucking shoot him. And they closed the door. You shot at him? Yeah, I okay. want to kill him. And they called the police. I went outside, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to go anywhere. That's it, my target is to kill him. And the police came and the sergeant, he, we play basketball together. <laughs> he know me very well. Yeah, after I play basketball and high jump, I start getting a noun in my city, Mosul. So he know me, he says, what's going on? I told him this and that. He just, fuck him. Do whatever. I'm just going to block all the calls. <laughs> like, awesome. Went back and with the pistol near the doors, like, motherfucker, come. <laughs> He, he run away. Imagine Iraqi general. But there, were, there was no repercussions for that? I mean, he's an Iraqi general. There, they nothing... tried to capture me all day, can it? And it's kind of after 1991. See, this is when the government starts getting weak. The tribe rules getting more involved right so in that time tribe getting more involved and getting more power and he know if he can do something my my tribe will be the shit out of him got it or they can kill him or something so i think he pulled back so even though he was with the iraqi army yeah. the the tribes had more power than the army maybe 1990 1980 until 1990 before been- we had in kuwait Maybe as position in his general, he can hurt me so bad. But after 1990. And so you went into the military the first time in what year? Uh, 1988 until 1991. And you loosely saw some action during the first Gulf War. Yeah. I remember I saw like the tornado, the... um, uh, British air jet, they stop and they shoot. Because you were part of an anti-aircraft yeah. unit, correct? Yeah. And it's like, fuck, that's fucking stupid. With this fucking guns, we cannot fight those. <laughs> what the fuck? And I, I remember the American bomber through like box and when they hit the ground it's open with with bombs a grenade or something we don't know and i remember one of the guys his captain i don't want to talk shit about him he's he's killed he's just like bring me bring me those people they want to scare us it's not about scare it's fucking signs and he shoot it with ak and the blow up in his face killed him it's like that's what you get, fucker. And you talk about in your book the 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 lack of quality leadership that was part of the Iraqi army. There's no leadership. And all all what we have slavery. You have to listen to them and in the same time they don't pay you enough to live with dignity and you have to sacrifice your life. It's like fuck that shit. And that's why in 2003, when the United States liberated Iraq, everything collapsed because it's built on nothing. There is no morals. There is no belief. 
when I say belief is not religion, but believe this is your country and you have to defend it. In all leader, in hundred years, in all the Middle East, they killed loyalty inside us. Like, look to United States now. Sometime I love to drive in the middle of nowhere. You have to see someone on the street, old guy, whatever, taking the trash. Clean this in the middle of nowhere. Because believe this is my country. Or you, I traveled one time to Fresno from Fresno to Yosemite. Okay. And in the middle of nowhere, small house with American flag. This is, he did not put it so Biden or the Congress guy, he can look at it and, oh, give him $1,000. No, he put it because he believed this is my country. We don't have that belief. And maybe I want to talk about that, the immigration things, how affect the American culture when you, when we, uh, when you uh, have time about it. We'll definitely get there. The, the thing that stuck out to me in the book about your first time in the military is, so right after the, the Gulf War basically pushed Iraq out of Kuwait and then we were done, you talk about how at that point in time, the, the Iraqi people on the Kuwaiti border actually started rebelling against the government and started pushing back. And Saddam was sending soldiers down there basically to kill other Iraqis. And you, you point out in the book that you're glad that you were able to avoid that. Were you out of the military at that point or did you just dis, uh, disobey an order to go down there? No, I am on the military, but I am almost close to the north than the south. Okay. And my brother, he's in the army. He went there and he helped a lot of people. Because right now, like for the, all the audience, when they can hear us, oh, they don't have order from the judge. They cannot catch innocent. No, we can catch innocent. We can kill the innocent. We can do whatever we can do. Don't think in American way. Right. In Iraq, there's no rules. And he helped as much as he can. And my oldest brother, too, he worked uh, as bodyguard for one of the uh, Arab Socialist Party uh, member. And he saw people in Kuwait, they stealing everything. Everything. And he just bring like a small table. He says, I just saw it. And it's like, you know what? They can break it or they can, I'm, I'm just going to take it. And all this kind of things, like I told you, this has been hundreds and hundreds of years. And when Saddam came, he accelerated the action for the people to refuse the government. Not only Saddam, but it looks like they refuse all the leaders in 100 years. It's like, we are done, motherfuckers. Go away. It looks like in civil war. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I am running from Europe. I'm done with potato eating breakfast and lunch and dinner. I want to practice my religion. I want, I want to press my opinion about politics. And you come here and you want me to pay tax? Fuck you. I'm going to fight you back. You know what I mean? Right. So same thing, but the difference is we are being severing in 100 years. And that's why the south of Iraq uh, make revolution against Saddam's. They kill a lot of, of them, torture them. And what give, I think, good lesson for Saddam's and his tribe you're not going to be for a long time. And so you come out of the military in the early 90s, and in that period of, of the middle 90s, you became a truck driver. Yes. And and pretty much drove all over the country. Um, but then you were you were pulled back into the military in 97. How did that happen? So they call it uh, reserve. Oh, okay. And you have to go and spend 
couple months. And I remember it's like, fuck, couple months without paying me, without working, my family's going to be struggle. So in that time, I'm working heavy machine grader. And our pace at the airport, most of the airport, and they do like donation. Hey, anyone have donation for this and that? You have a couple of weeks off. So they ask if anyone have grader to uh, straight the roads. And I told them, I can't do that. How much? They says, we give you one month. Like, awesome. So I bring the grader. I told my boss. And he says, yeah, I took it. I came and I clean it and I hit one of the cables. I think communication cables. <laughs> I shut down the airport. <laughs> I didn't tell anyone about it. So anyway, after one month, I came back. It's like, fuck, I need something else. And there's like uh, Air Force because we are at the airport base. We belong to the Air Force. Air Force championship in Iraq. And they says, if anyone want to play uh, any game, we can give him a vacation. So I told him, yeah, I play high jump. So I went to Baghdad and I took the first degree. I jumped 170. <laughs> and I spent the other months on vacation. And so will you only get called back one time? Yeah. And so once that, that first callback is done, then you're done. Done. Okay. Yeah. So I want to fast forward to obviously 9-11. And you, you talk about in the book how... Initially, there was a lot of praise for the attack in Iraq. And then the one thing that you comment on is how Saddam almost took credit for it when he really didn't have an involvement in it. No. And, and that started kind of changing even more of the, the public's opinion. But when the U.S. forces came to liberate, you talk about in the book how initially you were not happy for that. And, and can you explain why the the initial U.S., I don't want to call it an invasion, whatever you want to refer to it as, but U.S. soldiers were on the ground in Iraq. You weren't really happy for that to start with. So I am happy with save us from old regime, but I'm not happy with uh, the plan after liberation because they released the army, and there is no job, there is no business, and I know this kind of environment is going to be a very healthy environment for extremists. So I'm not happy with that, and I start talk with people, and you know we don't know who is make the the decision. We, I just talk with everyone. Hey, now you are safe. Now you walk in everywhere in Mosul, and kids they love you. People they just smile. After a few months, if you are not going to do something, you can start scared from the street. You can start feel everything attacking you. But so just no one, coming in and getting rid of Saddam doesn't correct the problems. No. We create another problem. We build health environment. We build health environment for poison and recruit innocent people to, to be extremists. And this is what happened. And people, they don't have job, what they can do. You pay him $100. Hey, just watch the American cowboy. Oh, okay. I'll do that. Next time, hey, you know what? Just put kneels. Next time, and they, and you know, we did a lot of mistake. And they use that mistake against us. Because, you know, we don't have anything on the ground. I'm talking now as American. We don't have anything on the ground. The Qaeda, they have the ground. They control the ground. They control the community. They are among them. We have nothing. And, and include that, we make mistake. So it looks like we give them enough tools to recruit more people against us. I'm going to tell you one of the story. And this is reality. And I think... Time's up for the United States, for us to raise ourselves above all the bullshit 
racism, black life matter, white life matter. And we have to tell, start tell the truth. One of the things in the United States, wrong policy, foreign policy, like my cousin, we drink me and him every day. You know, Muslim, serious Muslim, they don't drink. And we just talk about fun, this and that. His girlfriend, he married, but he have girlfriend. He's kind of have issue with her. She went to the American and she says, oh, he sit in the garage and he built bombs, car bombs. Came, captured him for six months. When they sent him to Buka. And if any American work in Buka, he will says yes. This is what happened. After they release him after six months, he became not against American. Before he's with American against Savage. Now he is more passionate about Savage and against American. So imagine thousands and thousands of innocent people, we just put them on the jail for no reason. So this is why I, I am happy in, 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 in general opinion, in general benefit, because we release, you know, I said release us from Saddam, but in personal level, I'm not happy because I can tell in the future it's going to be chaos. So they didn't, they didn't come in with a big plan. They came in with a small plan. Yeah. Let's just get rid of this one issue. As always, always. Like, look, from my understanding, you're ex-law enforcement, right? I'm current law enforcement, okay. but that, uh, I've been a cop for 30 yeah. years. Yeah. So look at you. You go into the patrol. You drove your car. You don't know who's going to kill you. And in 7-Eleven, in gas station... The drug, women, you, you don't know who's going to kill you. You're facing that things every time. And look at the politic. You see, different line. Right. How many people have you saved? How many times you risk your life? And look at the politic who's present you. Different agenda. So same thing in, in Iraq. Look at the soldier who sacrifice, who does everything they can do to help Iraqis, but they don't have the, the, the right mechanism to give them hope. And look at the politic, Paul the Premier, what he did. He bring all the traders, gather them, and give them the power. And now we're getting the result from the plan, the seed we planted in Iraq. Right. You're now seeing what was the, the negative aspect of putting the wrong people in place and, and not giving, not, not helping build a solid enough infrastructure to move forward. Correct. So after the United States came in, uh, we're, we're deep into, or we're getting deeper into the war, work became much harder for you to find. Before we move to that, I would love, if you don't mind, to go back to 9-11. Please. So when I look at 9-11, I remember some people, they are happy. Some people, they are best. They are sad. I am one of them. And I discussed with people. I told him, this is coward. You remember the warrior, to be warrior. Change. So it's like kind of I am having the warrior morals, you know what I mean? Rules, code. I told him, it's easy. Like we, we can bring a beautiful car right now. It's take us five minutes to destroy it. How long is it gonna take us to build it? I told him those people who attack it, they can lose. Because in all the history, destroyed and damaged never been part of solution. And I knew it. Qaeda is going to be destroyed. It's going to be finished from the resources. But it's just take time. Sorry for it. No. 
And and that insight for you to see that the attacks of 9-11 were wrong, the overall goals of Al-Qaeda were going to fail, where do you think that emotional intelligence in you to see that bigger picture comes from? So, when I saw all the damage and people they tried to jump from thousand thousand meters and it's just like one vision came to me if you want to build better tomorrow you cannot build it in the blood and this is kind of bring idea i'm not gonna stay in iraq i mean i have the idea from 1982, when they bring the dead body. Do you remember we talked yes. about it? Yes. And now it was like, done. Done deal. I need to escape. I never think to escape smuggling border or anything, but now I need to do something. Especially I have kids with me now, and they deserve better life. I mean, me and you, we can go right now, struggle in our life, or we have mission, we struggle, we, we, we can be starving for food, we eat whatever, but, and we will be fine. Maybe we'll make some joke. But when these things came to our kids, it's going to hurt us so yes. bad. Yes. So, so that's kind of give me the enough motivation to, I'm done. But you never acted on it early on to get out of the country, and we're going we're gonna to come into that. Was there ever any talk amongst your family in the earlier days, right after the the U.S. first came into the country, to get out? So when they came to the country, this is what I thought in that time. As I mentioned, I read history. And I look at Germany. 1945, when Hitler gone. And right now. I look at the Japan in 1945, 42, 43. I look at Bear Harbor, all this kind of history. And look at the Japan now and Germany is like, shit, we can be like Japan and Germany one time, one day. The only things I didn't calculate it right, the environment and the country around Iraq, different the uh, environment and country around German and Japan. I didn't calculate it right. So in that time, I'm just thinking, Iraq is going to be way better. It's going to be American. American. It's going to be like 52 state. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Not 50, but it's going to be like the favorite son right. to the United States. We can uh, live the American dream. Done. It's come to me, you know? Done deal. So... That's what I thought, and all what I need is like I'm fighting for American dream for years to live one day, and they come to me. Now I need to work with them. And I try maybe five, six times. All of them failed, and I can go with details if you want. This is when you first started trying to be an interpreter? Yes. Yes. No, and I want to talk about that because crossing, making the initial decision to start working with the U.S. military forces, was there any concern about the safety to your family no. for, for doing that? No. I because mean, early on, the, the Americans were welcomed. Yeah. So it was not a big deal. But when you first started trying to become an interpreter, you you ran into walls because of the tribes and the religion that divides your country still a am i wrong yeah no you, you're right but the thing is with when united states came no one considered them they are infidel they are christian they are invader no everyone think about the heavy weight in our shoulder goes away and you, you remember i told you like the american soldier they walk on the street they just walk they like one of them, uh, I can't call him right now. Uh, he's from the first team I work with. Uh, we go to them, we running uh, Iraqi uh, police station. 
and to the next to the police station, there's coffee shop. I took him to coffee shop. Me, only me and him. We go, we sit there, this and that. But like I told you, the foreign wrong policy. This is where fucked up the soldier purpose and sacrifice. But in that time, everyone, if he can work with Americans, can be big, proud thing, big, awesome things, because no one consider them enemy. No one consider them different religion or anything. And that's why, and I need money because there is no business. So at the beginning, I start going to the market and you know, every business you have to calculate your things. Okay, what do we have here? We have those soldiers from my experience through the Hollywood movie, they love beer. They replace beer with water. And I don't think so they can be drunk on the base because this can affect the duty. Right. How about if I sell them beer? So I start selling beer, like take a case of beer and throw it and they threw 20 bucks. I bought it for $2 or something. And uh, I make good money. And one time they threw emery box and I took it as like, shit, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Uh, this is, I think this is kind of give me another deep resource thing came from my mom when I took the Emory box to my mom and we open it and, you know, we read chicken and I start open it and she asked me, she's, you know, she's old lady, never been in the school. Uh, she have life education. Right. She says, uh, son, is this a scam? They give it only for soldiers, for officer, or what's the deal? I said, no, no, no. Every soldier, he have boxes. She says, son, this country who take care of the simple peace on the army, they can win everywhere they go. I, I didn't think about it. It's true though. And, and, but what's funny is you talk to the, the servicemen and women, they talk about an MRE and they're like, Oh, an MRE. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but your mom was right. Yeah. You know, something as simple as making sure that they have good food for all of their soldiers. Because we compare them with our soldiers, our soldier, all what they reach them, soup or something that no one know. And maybe a small piece of rice. It looks like Nazi camp. Right. Compared to all this food, this is luxury. Right. You know what I mean? And this is why, like, start so bad to work with Americans. Because this is my, my gate to the American dream. And I start so hard, but I couldn't succeed. Lack of luck, lack of language, I don't know. But I didn't succeed until one time I helped the infantry unit and the LT, he says, hey, you want to work with us? I was like, fuck yeah, of course I want to work with you. But part of the, part of the, the problem that you had being brought on as an interpreter had to deal more with your own people and because they were controlling who was allowed to be an interpreter, or did I mis no, misunderstand I will, the book? No, I will tell you. So the thing is, like when I get the first interview, I went to the airport, which is the American base, the same airport, I cut the cable <laughs> for communication. Was the cable finally fixed? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Depend if we succeed or fail in Iraq. <laughs> So I went there and my appointment's nine o'clock. Pull the mic just a little closer. Just, there you go. Nine o'clock. And I went seven o'clock in the morning and this looked like one-way ticket. And you had to walk all the way, correct? Yeah. That's why I said one-way ticket. It's like, <laughs> I'm having this job no matter what. 
waiting from seven o'clock and they told the guy who's in charge about the screening, the interview, and he says, yeah, you're nine o'clock, you have time. And his accent is Kurdish. I'm waiting seven, seven fifty, seven thirty, and I'm dreaming in all the years I did connect every destiny line. I'm thinking about my wife, my kids, if I start work and have my uh, my uh, first salary from Uncle Sam, which is US dollars. By the way, in that time, we don't have color TV, we don't have a fridge, we don't have anything. So all this kind of things make the time go so fast, you know? I mean, I cannot compare it to any job in the United States compared to that time when I wait to the first job for my American dream. Right. So anyway, 8.45, I came to the, to the guy, I told him, please don't forget. And I'm so apply, so respectful. And he says, we will see, we will see. Stop bugging me. It's like, fuck, this is not a good sign. And while I'm waiting from 7 to 8.45, I saw some guys came, talk with him in Kurdish, because different language, and they went inside. Except me and a few other people who talk Arabic, they don't get that chance. 8.50, 8.55, I went to him, I told him, hey, can I go in? He says, did I, uh, says, yeah. Did I told you come in? Just wait until I told you. It's like, fuck. Bro, it's fucking nine o'clock. He says, you know what? You're bugging me a lot. You don't have an interview. It's like, fuck you, motherfucker. So I captured between us, their seal wire. I just captured him and I hit him with my head, broke his nose, and they start beating the shit out of him. And there is a U.S. Army guy black guy he said he came and he just pushed me he says hey this guy is american citizen and i saw what he did to you guys it's not fair my duty to protect him you have to run now or i'm gonna take you to the jail it's like fuck in the state of american dream go to the american jail that's right. what i need fuck that shit so i left try after that few times so he was the the guy that was giving you the problems and and didn't let you get the interview he was uh now an american citizen he's but he a, was he's american citizen kurdish but so brought back to be an interpreter yeah and he just wants his own people to hire got it and i left and it's like fuck it try two times there is no luck until one time, sitting in my uh, uncle's uh, shop, we drink local scotch, scotch, and that scotch is the first couple shot, you feel comfortable, <laughs> but next day you have to be prepared for diarrhea. <laughs> next day you have to be prepared for shaking body. <laughs> so... But it's cheap. I mean, this is what we can offer. And I remember that, you know, it's different between United States uh, culture for drink and Arabic culture, Iraqi culture. Iraqi culture, when we drink, we eat. You guys eat first, and after that, you drink. We have different. I remember when we eat, we have only one cucumber, and we've divided for between us and everyone he eat his own piece. He cannot eat more. So imagine right. how much we are poor. Right. And at that time I have 50 cent in my pocket, which is $500. And that $500 can give me right to my home, which is seven miles away, 10 miles or buy smoke because I smoke cigarettes at that time or keep it to my kids next day to go buy candy or school, whatever. So it's like, you know what? Sometimes, you know, when you have a lot of stress, you just want to push it. 
just want to find your own things from the chaos. So just let me walk. And in that time, I don't care about anything in the world more than what I care about the 50 cent in my pocket. So I'm walking and I hear three Iraqi ladies. They start talk shit bad about American forces, American unit in front of us. It's like, fuck, that's what I need. From 50 cent struggling, now life and death. Because in my culture, if anyone attack, disrespect, insult women, I have to protect them. Same thing here, same thing everywhere. So it's like, fuck me. I don't so need- you saw yourself potentially in a position where you would have to engage the U.S. soldiers if they were going to try to harm yeah, the women. I have no option. And of course, they can kill me. I have no weapon, nothing. Right. And... So it looked like I did not satisfy my 50 cent. Now I have to deal with death. It's like, fuck, okay. And it's so unique. Like the human brain is so flexible. <laughs> you can <laughs> deal with different matter in one time. So I'm thinking it's like, shit, let me walk fast. Talk with the American unit. Maybe they can let me solve the issue or talk with the interpreter. I just leave give myself moral moral reason to satisfy my dignity and save my life. So I went and I talked with them. There is no interpreter. There is a, a sergeant, Sergeant Bird, God bless him. I told him, sir, in my basic language that time, can I solve the issue? He said, yeah, go ahead. Like three jackass, you know. So when those three ladies came to the Humvees and building, and you know, there's white light. I recognize them. They are hookers. It's like, fuck. <laughs> I spent fucking <laughs> several minutes from my life thinking about death for them. <laughs> and they are fucking hookers. Fuck me. I should go back to 50 cent. This is done deal. So they know me. And it's because, you know, the, the same neighbor. I told them, go back. I don't want to see your face. And I remember I did this. <laughs> My finger. Go back. I don't want to see your face. Oh, you know, I don't know. I don't want to fucking know. What were they complaining about? So... They used to live in the building, government building. The military police, they came and they kicked him out. Oh, okay. And they're pissed off and they want to have this building divided and they sell it in the future. So I told him, I don't want to know. It's like, motherfucker, I'm almost killing myself <laughs> because of you. Go back. So when they left, I think the way how I talk with the three ladies and point and they listen to me, Sergeant Bird, I think he admire my things. And he says, oh, thank you. That's good, this and that. And you know, most of the people, foreigner people work with Americans. They don't have that language. They just wave head, right. you know? Very passive. Yeah, and just like to save themselves from, from embarrassment. While I'm getting the greeting from my dream, and this is the window, the gate, this is my plan, you know? One guy, he came, the pimp, start talking shit about the American translator. It's like, I'm not even American translator yet. And you talk shit. It's like, fuck. Well, I have to do the right things so in front of them, so maybe I, get, I can get a job. So I told him, hey, don't listen. Uh, listen, please. This is government building. Sergeant, he told me nothing about it. I just established the idea. I think that's why the SEALs, they love me. Because I can be flexible in any condition. And as you know, it's government building. It's not civilian or it's not Arab Socialist Party member houses or something. So please just be 
uh, have enough understanding and leave. He says, fuck you. You're a fucking motherfucker. You don't know who I am. It's like, <laughs> no. Who is fucking you? And he starts talking about himself, you know, brag about himself and talking shit about my family. This is like red line. Right. Again, I just had him, broke his nose and I start fucking beat him, lay him down. And you like the headbutt, don't you? No, <laughs> I hate my destiny. Every time change. Like imagine the fucking 50 cent and the destiny accelerated to life and death. And now instead of he appreciates what I did, he talks shit about my family. Right. So when I had him, I did not hit him as a person. I had my destiny and my fucking 50 cent in my pocket. Almost like, you know, when you fight for one minute and someone underneath you and you beat him, it's a long time. Mm. And I hear Sergeant Bird, he says, hey, do you want to work with us? It's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you got, an, you got an end around into becoming an interpreter through that one incident. Yeah. And the one thing that stands out to me, because you didn't address that in the book. So in a very religious controlled country, there's still hookers and pimps. I mean, do you remember when we talk Western, mm -hmm. my family, they don't go to the mount. Right. We are not religion country. Okay. But I, there is religion. Right. But we are not. But after 2005, we can talk about that. Iraq became more religious. Okay. But before 2003, people, they are not so religious. No. Okay. Like I just told you, me and my uncle and my cousin, right. we drink, we share the cucumber pieces. We drink. This is against religion, a drink. We drink. I told you about my cousin who's on the jail because his girlfriend, girlfriend the other hooker, she reported him to American forces. You know what I mean? So it's like kind of relaxing. I mean, if you look at YouTube now, just put back that 1980, 1990, you will see like Western clothes. You don't see a lot of hijab. This is all that start change after 2003. Got it. Yeah. So you're from this incident where you, you basically kind of, got pushed into it more because you were thinking you were going to have to protect the women that ended up being your catalyst to start being an interpreter. And you were working with the army MPs. Correct. Um, and basically the, in that, what I really want to talk about is you bring up a lot of great strategies that worked for you the way you interviewed people, the way you read a room, you looked at everything in the room and you're kind of like, this doesn't equal up. He's saying I'm not, but he's got all this other stuff or whatever. Um, it's very much just like being a cop. Did you find that those instincts came naturally to you? So before we go to that, because most of those kills came with seals. Yeah, but you started, at least in the book, it sounds like you started developing a little bit yeah. of that skill set while you were working with the MPs? Let me make it more easy to understand okay. for the audience. Please. Like you, can I mention where you live? Yes, Temecula. Yeah, you live in Temecula and you are law enforcement. You know where is drug. Yes. You know where is this, you know where is that. You know the sign of shoes on the teal wire, what does that mean? You know the drug dealer, he's gonna use explorer guy to save the road, you know, this, all these details, this is part of our life. Right. And mostly, especially for someone like me, like, like to drink, you know, drink like magnetic for all the crime, corrupt, fight, good, bad, you know what I mean? But if you go to the mosque or religion, you never hear someone have his girlfriend, she's hooker, or he steal money or he beat another guy. You know what I mean? So me with the, all the drink and fighting, go to the night club. Sometimes I don't have money. I go to night club, beat the biggest guy just to prove myself. So next time I can come and drink and eat it for free. 
So this is normal things to know where is the gang, where is the fraud, where is all that things. When I work with American military police, I didn't develop any skills. I didn't work in anything. They just want to have fun to catch thief, and they know where is it. Because I am among them. My environment, you know what I mean? And that's why, like, we have a lot of crazy mission. And I'm part of successful tools, piece, small piece in that mission. And this is how I build my name. But all that getting changed when I moved to the SEALs. But before we move that, I'm going to tell you one of the mission with sure, please. military police. Please. So you will have understanding about the American culture, the Iraqi culture, and uh, what do you call it? Street smart? Mm -hmm. So one time, uh, Mosul divided two parts, left and right. We are in the right part. Our military police unit run the right part. Another military unit run the left part, American military unit, which is running the police station. The left part, they ask for support, more interpreter, because they have big mission in left part market of Mosul. They say, send me, because they love me and they, they consider me, I will make everything to make, make the mission succeed. So and I, I think that that's what I was trying to hit on is yeah. you developed, you were not a passive interpreter. You were very much, Hey, let's go get it. Let's, let's get after More it. action. Yeah. And, and so I think that that's the reputation that, yeah. that I was saying that you were kind of building for yourself. Yep. Because most of the language with us, they are more, more focusing, translating, admin, document, or just translate between the sergeant officer and Iraqi sergeant officers. But when they have mission or something and what they ask, hey, where's the gang, where's the bad, where's the thief? They ask me. Well, I'm not a thief, uh, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it goes back to, and, and this is the same way I'll say for a lot of police officers here in this country, there are some of us who got into trouble as kids. We weren't the, we weren't good boys or good girls, so to speak. And I think sometimes that makes you a better police officer because you may not be involved in it, but you know where it's at and you know how to spot it. You have the street knowledge. Yep. And especially kids struggling, fighting, live in ghetto, when he became police officer, he was just surprised like how this police officer react compared to the one who came from Harvard. Yes. Is a huge difference. Yes. This guy, he make awesome, beautiful report. This guy, he make awesome, badass fucking action. So, same thing. So anyway, so I went to military police uh, at the left side headquarters and I'm just sitting with them and the American military police and Iraqi police and there is the interpreter they translate between them. So the mission is sending Iraqi police to that market, which is crowded market. And there is coffee shop in the center of the market those Iraqi police, they came, all of them, they surround it. And there is like investigator, they came inside the coffee shop. They catch the weapon dealer, which is stupid. And they crowd it. With Iraqi police, they have no high training. This is not going to work. And I knew it. And I told them, okay, but any question? And military police, they can surround the neighbor, the market, with the Humvees. Any question, I tell them, hey, how we can know each other? I am from the other side, and they have 10 police from me. We don't, we are not familiar with faces. 
Oh, he says, all of you guys, we're going to give you white hat. White or red hat. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? It's like, yeah. It's like, maybe American, they know more than us. Fuck it. Let's do it. And the salary is almost two, two days away from me. And I don't want to do anything to stop my salary. It's like, fuck it. I'm just going to do it. So we went to the market. Until now, they don't know if I am a translator or I am police. So I went, I walk with them, but I don't have weapon. The police, all of them, they have a pistol, a clock. We walk, I know where's the fucking coffee shop, an area called Nebi Yunus. This mean Yunus and Private. It's an old place. I went to that fucking coffee shop and they saw the guy. I went inside and I know the guy. And I saw like AK-47 next to him and there is two guys with him. So I'm waiting. I order tea. I drink the tea. And they just saw like white or redhead. I don't remember. Like just coming and back, just coming back. And while I'm sitting, I hear that guy. He says, hey, uh, our explorer, because they put people to tell them if there's anything. This is the police and the American, they surround the area. He says, okay, let's go one by one. So he want to go like it's the size of the coffee shop. It's long, but the weight from here to the end of the wall. So he want to send out, I came and I just pushed him so hard because I just want to surprise him and I don't have a weapon. And I just took the AK and I push him. Soon they saw that one of the guys start shooting outside. It's like warning and chaos. I kept that guy underneath me on the table, but there's one guy behind me, he hit me and I fell down and he ran away. I still have the fucking AK. I start chasing him and close to the market, the area called Nebunis, there's like mountain, small mountain. And there's like track route. I saw him, he followed the route and there's like fucking shooting everywhere. Not from the bad guys, from the Iraqi police. Because you saw the white hat. The white hat with pistol and <laughs> boom, boom. It's like, fuck, and they just my AK and just running behind the guy. And he almost like start like going up and I start shoot him. Couple round. I know he get head and, but he's still like dumping and walk. And they went to him and I follow him, capture him. And I took him back from the other side of a, uh, we can call it hell, not mountain. And I took taxi and I took him to the police station. <laughs> Put him in a taxi. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he's bleeding his leg. I didn't want to kill him because I don't know the, not the rule of engagement, but I don't want to do anything like over. You right. know what I mean? No, I understand. So I took him there and this is ha like after two year, two hours. So I took him all the way down, walk him with me, my AK, talk with people. Hey, I am police. This guy, he's fucking de weapon dealer, this and that. So almost couple couple hours take me to reach to the police station. When I reached to the police station, I saw the American forces and Iraqi police, they gather. And they says, who you are? Told him, I am one of the guys on the mission. And one of the Americans, he know my face. He says, yeah, yeah, I know him. Who is this guy? I told him he's the jackpot. He says, oh, awesome. <laughs> and he told the major and the major, he'd make big announcement. Hey, we want to thank, because the mission failed. The American military police, they didn't, stuck on the plan because it's so crowded you don't know who's your enemy right. so it's safety to pull back the iraqi cops they run away and accept me so when i head back it's like fucking good deal mission succeed 
and they look at the picture, it's like, shit, good job. And they make <laughs> announcement to promote me to officer. <laughs> Tell them, sir, I am translator. So imagine this is one of the, how I build my name and my, not because I'm planning to build, but because I am who I am. Right. Yeah. And that reputation is then what crossed you over because you were recommended to work with the SEALs. SEALs, correct. And so you started working with them in 2004? Beginning of 2004. And in the book, there's numerous stories. And, it, you know, the like I said, um, you, you kind of developed, or maybe you had it instinctively, instinctually in you, one of the stories that stands out, and and if you can talk about it, the the jackpot target that you got by looking through the the names and calling off the names because you were going to give them a gift. How did that come about? Okay. So before we go to that, you have to. I mean, you will love this this one. So Sergeant East, he recommended me to the sales community, and. After a few days, Sergeant E.C. told me, Johnny, you can work with SEALs. No, Riyadh, they don't call me Johnny. You can work with SEALs. I don't know who's fucking SEAL. Told him how much they pay. He says, they pay me 100 military police. Those 500, it's like, I'm in. I went back. It's like Sherlock Holmes. Smart guy, smart ass. Try to find seals, but I'm work with them no matter what. And at that time, there is no anti-activity. There is no no car bombs, nothing. Went back and there is big ass dictionary. Seal, 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 seal. Find it. Animal see. It's like, what the fuck. Lives in the water. <laughs> yeah. It's like, fuck. What? Well, fuck it. It's five hundred. I'll do it. So anyway, a few days, I went for interview. So first weird things, dictionary seal. Second things, interview inside the truck. And when I went to the base, there is guards inside the American base. And there is only beard, different weapon, different people. It's like, fuck, 500, it's worth it. You know, because you are lead, alpha male. You go into unknown situation, situation you are not control of. You can have that feeling losing of your leading skill. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we sit in the car, truck, Tacoma, pick up me and JT Freeze. God bless him. He died a couple of years ago. And we just talk. Actually, he just talk. I'm just listening because I don't have language. And I just want to, like, save myself from, from embarrassment. I told him, did I get the job? He says, indeed. Thank you so much. I went back to the military police facility, and all of them, they are, wait. Did you get the job? I told him, indeed. I look at to the faces, all of them, fuck yes. Like, fuck, I get the job. I didn't know indeed this mean yes. And I start work with SEALs. Before we go to that story, because this is between Delta Force and SEALs. When I work with them, the first mission, they give me body armor, they give me helmet, they give me night vision, and I didn't like it. I didn't like the helmet. I didn't like the body armor. It's like, guys, it's my life. I want to die in the way I want. It's like, no, no, this is rules. You have to do it. It's like, Fuck. Okay. So I put it on, we went to the machine and they have one guy, he scored me, left, right, stay, go. So we stay next to the house, right, target, and they just hear explosion. It's like, fuck me, run, Johnny, run. I just run my ass off. Because I went to the brief, I understand nothing than the target, the jackpot name Abdullah. Because only he's a pronounced Abdullah, I understand it. Anything else, I have no idea. 
So I run my ass off from the explosion. And the guy who scored me, he's running after with the all the gears and whooping. Johnny, stop, motherfucker, stop. So I stopped and he told, you hear that? He says, yeah. So what is it? He says, we try to open the door. It's like, fuck. So seal the word weird things, first weird things, right? Interview inside the truck. And when they open the door. They blow the door. They blow the door. <laughs> this is not part of my culture, not part of me. So it's like, fuck, I hope I am not end up with something bigger than me. So we start taking the guys with us, question them. Again, at that time, it's peaceful. There's nothing. That's what we thought. We catch two, three guys. We find warehouse, explosion, 155 round. All demolition tools. Do you remember 9-11? My feeling? It's easy to destroy it. Right. Damage. But how long is it going to take you to build? So when I saw those people, they came with damage, destroyed, demolition tools it's like those people they are not gonna build it still if they consider united states enemy instead of you fight him build a relationship with him use benefit from all the advanced technology and pers- live, let your ha- your country live prosperity and let people live with dignity But you fight them and people, they have no job. So it was like, when I saw that, it was like, fuck. This is where I start training. I started to practice my language with SEAL. I told the SEAL, hey, I need someone to teach me fucking English. And they start teach me English every day, one, two hours. And they start teach me weapon, watching, all the skills they know. And mix it with what I what I know. And you remember when I told you if you can if you try or if you're planning to be a warrior, you have to be ready to face the worst kind of a human, the ugly face of a human. You have to think like them, you have to eat like them, you have to do everything like them, except killing, of course. And this is what I did. And this is what what has changed who I am from street smart, I think, to the warrior, which is, I wish I deserved that title, which is bring me back to my dream from 1975, 76, to be a warrior, change the world, and find all the struggle until I play basketball, and have the American dream window to be warrior until 2004 when I start work with the SEALs and start facing demon. And this is where I feel like no shit. I'm doing my dream, I'm following my dream. And you even talk about it in the book of going on some missions and some operations and and talking about how we as Americans try to operate in a country like that as Americans where not torture but you also need to know when it's time to hey these you know people are only going to react to a certain way and and that was one of the things that you almost taught them is like hey we've got to push the boundaries a little bit and and you you made some people think that maybe they were going to be taken away or their families were going to be taken away. And they, and you used it to your leverage. So one of the things I added without bragging about it to SEALs community is cultural awareness. Because no matter how much you are advanced warrior, training, skill, technology, if you don't have cultural knowledge you are not perfect warrior 
And I think this is where my my position give me the opportunity to transfer the culture to sales community and make a huge change. Like people start thinking, oh shit, there is no kids on the street. Oh, that's been bad guys coming. We start using um, logic and make sense. In, in, in different American culture, and we have to accept it because, you know, if you are racist and full of hate, you would never accept any other culture. Right. Because you are blind. So you have to be high training in physics, using technology and the brain too, and accept other culture to flow inside you as a warrior. And I think this is my big achievement with SEALS community to accept others and accept culture and think as warrior. And except we lose some time. And this is what is, I don't want to talk about myself, but I think Tushin, he mentioned that several times when we had speech together that I add the culture to the SEALS community. Well, and you did. And, and something as simple as to, to expand on that, you implemented the practice of when you had to infill and take over a house for whatever mission, you would actually take off your uniform, put on your traditional clothes and go shopping for the family and prepare them food. So, so we have DA and OP. So when we saw team, had the target, find the jackpot, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do my things with my weapon, clear the room, do whatever. And after that, start before. And maybe this is a good lesson for our guys when they hit the cartel, gang, extremist. Don't go to your jackpot. Go to the SSC. Start find evidence. Because from my experience working with SEALs in that time, we don't have a lot of evidence. We don't have a lot of picture involve you with anti-activity. All what we have, we track in your phone through target list. And if I come to you and you know you kill 20 people, you build car bombs and I'm going to tell you, hey, your name is Dan? No, I'm not. So I have to prepare myself. I have to build my case inside the target and face you with that. And you mentioned about we push some rules, extend some rules. We have to, because we are not dealing with human. We're dealing with savages. But not everybody you were dealing with was savages. No. And there, there, were, there, were, a lot, people. there were a lot of good, and that's the point I was trying to make is in those missions where you were going to be will, hunkered in a, a yeah. location for a, a day or two or three was when instead of being rude and going to the people who live in that house and say, sit in that corner until we leave and don't say a word, you brought the idea of let's go to the market, get food and let's, you know, make food for these people. That's why I uh, try to divide it for two missions, sniper mission and DA, which is direct action, direct action. So the direct action, fast, furious, get in, get out 15. I have between 10 to 20 minutes to find the jackpot and leave the target or every minute can count in my responsibility to lose one of my brothers and they cannot live with my guilt. And that's why I have to find the SSC evidence, start talking with the kids, push, extend the rules, especially if he's bad. I don't give a shit about rules because I know those, they can kill my kids. They are not going to kill your kids. Maybe they can kill you, but your kids is safe in the United States. So I have to do everything to find if he's 
not 99.99 bad if he is 100 percent right. bad like one of the things in baghdad we found a guy we had the target we matched the phone you know how we track the phone mm. we catch him and phone is match everything good I start find his name through his kids, through his wife, because I divide all of them. I divide the mail, take the IDs, read everything. And this is all of it in seven to nine minutes I have. But did you learn that? Did somebody teach you that? Or did that just kind of come to you naturally? Come naturally and from SEALs too, because we work as a team. Right. Hey, what are we going to do? We don't have like leader all of us we leaders and this is kind of seals community they don't have lack of leadership because we have discipline and everyone leader so anyway we discuss all the hey how we can improve ourselves we have debrief when we head back from the mission hey you fucked up today fuck you this is not the way we fucking do business oh shit yeah you're right move on no 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 you know I did that because sometimes we judge others through our understanding. Because you can look to the weight different than my angle of looking, you know what I mean? So anyway, we develop ourselves in every aspect we know, we can, we know. So anyway, after I find all the evidence, start facing the jackpot from it because I have the surprise element. We remember the second weird, th third weird thing. We opened the door. We <laughs> breached the door. So same the guy, he's Johnny Walker. He's going to run away. He's scared. So I use this surprise element in my, in my side because I know as soon as I took him to facility, it's going to be medic, check him. No one do anything. No one scared. No one yell no one fucking do anything without anyone can snitch on you so anyway that guy i know he's a but i don't know what is it i know the family they hide something i don't know what is it what is it maybe documents maybe whatever so i talk with him and i have badass gloves and i pretend to punch his face, I punch the wall behind him. And fucking the sound of the wall is not right. And that's why it became like part of our job after we cleared the house. No matter where we go, we had the wall with, with weapons, with your hand, to just listen to the noise, if it's fake or not. So I told the guy, hey, this is fake walls, we need to fucking destroyed it we find a sniper we find every fucking things and we have list of the name some of them fucking kids they want to kidnap kids kill them because his father he's worked with americans or his father in iraqi government or something so when i read all that kind of things in that mission we extended almost for 30 minutes do you want me to respect him do you want me to tell him to please tell me? He's fucking killing my kid's dream. He fucking destroyed everything beautiful. I cannot fucking divide my feeling. Right. So I do everything except killing. Was that to get the, some information? Was that the operation that you talk about in the book where they were ready to move off target and there was something in you or just like we're missing something. And then it was back in another search is when they found the rifle and everything. Yeah. But also another example of understanding the culture and teaching the culture, you talk about how they were moving through a house and they have a very standard way of operating. Hey, we got to hit this door because this door is first. And you were saying, guys, there's all the shoes right outside that door. That's where everybody's going to be. And, and I'm not saying what they were doing was wrong. It's no. that you were bringing knowledge to they them. They do the basic, but they don't mix it with field evidence. Right. 
What do you see? Because because you have to be very flexible to change your plan to serve your purpose. Like in that mission, we had the target. And when we hit it, supposedly to hit the big ass target, which is cool. But I know in our culture, like if I am your guest, I'm going to sleep in, in the couch, right? In our culture, we have guest room. Mm. In village, small town, the guest room is completely separate from the house. I have suspicions about that when I look at the Valcom base image, but I didn't, maybe this is like bond for animals. I didn't tell. Right. So when we had the target and we saw all the shoes because we don't go inside uh, guest room with shoes, part of respectful, I told him, no, 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 no. We have to have this one. All the fucking males, which is 20 males inside. And one of them was like, motherfucker, do you work with them? <laughs> How you know? I told him, look, one, and I started explaining to him. And we had it. We found the jackpot there. You mentioned Touche already, and in the, in the book, you talk about how there was a mix. Some people took a while to start trusting you. Some people were a little more trusting. But one of the very poignant stories is when you really realized how much you were part of that the SEAL community um, and Touche coming back and riding in the, the very back vehicle with you. Can you... Yeah. Talk, talk about that. So I did not have planning to win anyone at trust. And just as a, a brief side note, for, yeah, those yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. for those who've not read the book, yeah. um, Touche is chief tat, tat in the book. Yep. So I have no attention to win a trust because I have no attention to cheat. So when I work with, with them, I work with belief. I want to work with those guys and I'm going to do everything I can to make mission successful because this is self my agenda too. protect my country, my people, my kids from savage bad guys who is destroyed 9-11, who we find the C4 explosion, demolition tools destroyed my city. So our goal match. So there is no need Oh, I'm going to do this so I can earn the trust. I'm gonna, no, just going to do everything I can. But the key success for trust, first time when I work with SEALs in Mosul, and I think after two, three, four mission, yeah, they are not know me very well, which is I don't know. And I didn't think, oh, let me trust him, and I, I know on the future they will trust me after they show who I am. And I remember Sergeant Brian, Brian Sergeant, he took me to his room and he says, uh, I know this is game show. It's not it's not legit story, but he just want to give me warning. Uh, I don't trust the Turp. I killed already a few of them. It's like, okay, why you tell me that? You don't trust me? No, 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 just let you know. It's like, okay. <laughs> just like warning. And I talk with him. He's, hey, I told him, you're fucking such a liar. So anyway, we had the mission, sniper mission. We went very soft, quiet, and somehow they know about us and they open fucking machine fire on us. And one of the guy, he gets hit. And at that time, I have only my helmet, night vision, and my body armor, cami, no weapon, nothing. And we are in the front yard, and I'm just like sitting beside the wall, and the guy, when I hear him hitting, is almost in front of me from here to the door. It's like, fuck, I want to save him, but I don't want to cross line with their procedure. And I'm waiting a few seconds, like fucking long time. It's like, fuck it. Whatever they can do, I don't give a shit. Fuck them. 
I have to save him. I didn't know where to say get head. He get head in his hand. I know how that after. So I went and I remember like, <laughs> and this fucking weird feeling. You don't have anything to protect yourself while you're facing your death, you know? It's this awkward feeling. I don't like it. I don't want to fucking see him be in that position again. I went and I pulled the guy and they just put him between my leg and they just like fucking hug him. It's like, hey, in my fucking awesome language at that time, <laughs> whatever is going to happen to you is going to happen to me. We good. So we went inside, we take him out and we went inside the base and there's senior chief, Calvin Spencer. He's the weirdest SEALs in SEALs community. <laughs> this is what the SEALs community said. He don't trust anyone. Only his team. Not even another SEAL team. No. <laughs> if anyone come, he don't trust other SEAL, he don't trust officer. When we head back, he says, I trust Johnny Walker. I think that ensign opened the trust gate between C me and SEAL community because it came from the weirdest, suspicious, lack of trust guy. And this is became... This is make my next and next and next mission easier to me to fit in and seal community. The reason why I keep bringing Jason Tushin's name up or, or Tush is because he had such a, an impact on you coming Close. here. Yeah. Um, but there's also a, a really cool story of really kind of making you feel like you were a yeah. part of their team. And, and can you tell me that part, story? Part of family more than team. Yeah, so one time, you know Fallujah, right? I've heard of it. Yeah, so it's a nasty place. We had big ass mission. And that mission, if I, thinking in that time, if I back with losing one leg, one arm, I will make body. So imagine how much the dangerous percentage is so high. So they put me at the last, last Humvee. It's like, motherfucker, I am the only Johnny Walker. You need me to find the jackpot, fighter, trigator, SSC, everything. If something happened to me, you fucked idiot. So I'm complaining with, between me and myself. Sitting, <laughs> Motherfuckers. <laughs> but we talk about it discipline and you grow up leadership inside each one of us that's why we succeed that's why in all my mission i lost no one and i think this is like big gift so anyway sitting complaining and two she came he acted weird more than me so i thought he's gonna say hey what's up what's going on he came and he jumped and he sit next to me. I never ever sit inside the Humvees. I feel like I'm fucking chicken ready to fry. So always I like to chicken to sit outside. So if something happened to me, I'm gonna take one of those motherfuckers with me. Um, you remember when I told you I don't like when I'm under attack without have. You want to be able to, an opportunity to fight back. To fight back. So I love to be outside. So at least to kill someone who's attacking me to take him to my fucking journey. So I'm sitting in all this kind of things. And two, she came and she sat next to me. It's like, and he's the senior chief in that lead mission. It's like, what the fuck? He's the leader. I am the only Johnny Walker. We sit in this fucking Humvees, there's something not match. There's no logic. It's like, what are you doing? Uh, I saw my brother sit by himself, so I thought uh, I'm going to sit next to him. It's like, what the fuck? This fuck is stupid. Go to the fucking lead Humvees and sit there. Where are you supposed to? Because you know we read the mobility. Uh, no, 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 we get. I fixed the last. It's like, fuck. All right. 
sometimes you have to accept. He sit next to me, and you know we have the armor black shield. He started to cover himself, or trying. He never did that before. Like all the mission, you know how we carry the weapons. We carry it like this, and we walk. It's like fucking party, you know? It's like, fuck. Those motherfuckers, Americans, they know something I don't know. <laughs> what are you telling me? What the fuck? All the logic things is giving me red flag. I'm sitting at the last MVs. The lead guy came sit next to me. The lead guy he, who never practiced fear in front of me. He's kind of fucking act suspicious, covering himself with fucking armor, black shield. It's like, Touche, what the fuck is going on, man? He says, no, you don't know, you don't know. It's like, okay, tell me maybe so I know I understand. No, you don't. And I will understand. Just fucking tell me. He said, bro, Mary Jo, Mary Jo, his wife. She says, Some, something happened to you, I will kick your ass. I didn't know what the response. Should I laugh? Should I say, oh, don't worry or anything? But it's like, I'm thinking it's like, those Americans so fucking weird. We go into Fallujah. I accept the result, the fact that losing arm or, or leg, and he's not worried about anything. He worried about Mary Jo. And he want his body, if something happened, to go one piece as dead. It's like, fuck that shit. But he leave the lead Humvee and sit next to me. It's meant the word to me. And I think loyalty never change. But I think this is make me more admire the leadership skill inside him by taking different level of a human to build the bridge. He's a, he's a, a great man and I don't want to undervalue anything that he did at all. I mean, I got the opportunity to interview him and for those who want to go back and listen to that interview is 73, but the, what he did for you and is, you know, I think as much a part of your story as everything that you did for the seals. And it was actually his first suggestion of, hey, do you want to come yeah. to the States? And you told him, no, your your idea at that point in time was I'm I'm staying, this is where I'm from and this is where I'm staying. You remember when I uh, told you about Germany and Japan? This is what I thought and what I hope in that time, my country, Iraq, will be like German and Japan. And I told you I didn't calculate it right the environment surrounding my country and the politic in the United States. Because what I saw from Touche and the soldier, military police, all they had passion to do the right things. And maybe someone, he says, oh, there is piece of shit American soldier, they killed innocent people. Yeah, we have it everywhere. We have it in our family. In every family, you, you find some someone fucking weird. How about fucking 250 soldier? Of course, you cannot find a thousand, two thousand fucking piece of shit. So, but all the passion, everything I saw through the American soldier destroyed by politic is different things. Back to Touche. By the way, all the SEAL community, Christian, Muslim, black, white, yellow, all of them, they have life mission, which is save Johnny Walker and his family. Not move, save. Everyone do his part more than anything else. Imagine how much this SEAL community, East and West Coast, every one of them, he put his life on line to save Johnny Walker and his family. But two, she's the one who is taking the responsibility of admin and everything as a brother of Johnny Walker. 
And I remember like before he leave Iraq, you know, we just like, hey, Johnny, if you change your mind, let me know, brother. It's like, fuck you. I'm not going to change my mind. And you go and have fun in your office. Now you are master chief moving paper from table to table and let me, I am the warrior, find the motherfuckers. So we just laugh, you know. But things getting changed from sometime you don't count it. I went back home and I will tell you the mission why I went home. You will you will love this one. I went home and when I said I went home, maybe someone think like, oh, he can uh, take his family, go everywhere. No, when I go home, I stay in my room with my AK, my grenade, ready to kill in the front of my kids. And this is the hardest things in our shoulder as parents to, to face ugly, savage things with the same re response and reaction. So I'm sitting do nothing, drink, and I saw my kids, they have nothing. No life, no school, no dream. And, and include all that, they hear that their dad is a trader. He's a piece of shit. And they cannot say anything. They cannot feel happy in front of me when they saw me. I didn't share them what I did. But they don't want to like brag, oh, dad, he come and he brings some gift or something. Because they care about my life. So they kill my kids. Happiness. Smile. Those savages. And I end up with this like, I think I'm so fucking selfish. This is 2006. From 2003, I'm fighting. I'm putting my life every day without asking anything a reward for my country. And I think it's time to fucking more, more than my country is to my family. I did my part. And that's why when I head back from my vacation, I went to Steve Wozowski. And I don't know if he told you the story or not. I went to Steve Wozowski, his captain. Uh, retired now. I told him, brother, I need to move from Iraq to United States. I'm done. And this is why. I want to restore my kids' a dream. I want to restore my kids' Honor, I want my kids to be proud when they mention my name. And that's why one of my daughter, I saw her like most of the time, she, she's my oldest daughter. This is not secret, but this is something I want to share it with you. Like when she go talk with public or, oh, my dad is Johnny Walker, my dad, because I know she's the adult one when she felt so embarrassing or not she didn't feel shame she, she always proud but she felt very proud to mention my name when someone talk shit about me especially when they put my name in the mask like i'm a trader of islam all these kind of things she, now she just look like she just want to proud about her dad she just want to restore her childhood missing by doing that. So anyway, I told Steve was asking, I told him, hey, this and that. And he called Tush. When he called Tush, when someone from Iraq called the master chief, that's mean he's not going to tell him, hey, what's up, what's going on? Usually bad news. Bad news, which is mean someone killed and he's he's inside the house with Mary Jo and his kids. And when he look at the phone and he know the phone from Iraq, he says, fuck. So he went outside and it's like, what's up? 
hey, Steve, hey, this is Steve, this and that. And I know he is like one of big concern. It's going to tell him John Walker killed, mission failed. And when he told him Johnny Walker, he went to move to the United States. It's like Johnny Walker killed or Johnny Walker moved to the United States. He's just like, fuck. Yes, he's angry and he's happy. Right. And he went back and he told Mary Jo and this and that. And this is, for him, the most beautiful mixed feeling. And he worked so hard. And you have to imagine, SEALs community, they have no connection with immigrant. They have no idea about the process. And the worst thing, if you ask SEALs to put camis with all the trident, all the things in public, they, they feel weird about it. They don't accept it. So he did that. He went to the immigration office. And while he asked around, there is a lawyer. He talked with the lawyer and the lawyer get pumped up about Johnny Walker. And he told him, you know what? I'll do it for free. And they started work on my case from that time. And what I want to use that as a, a catalyst to go backwards, because obviously sentiment changed amongst the people of Iraq as far as the Americans and, and where when you first started working as an interpreter with the MPs, it was something to brag about because they liked the Americans. They liked the, the American military, but it quickly went away and it quickly became you had to hide that you were working with the, the military. And if you can explain the distance between your home in Mosul and where you had to get to the base, and then you had several incidents that you that are in the book, but the first one of when you were driving and basically the guys came up on you and shot at you and you ended, yeah, you know. So if you can kind of explain how far you had to go from home to work, yeah, and then explain that one incident where you know you were being followed. So this is in two thousand four, and uh, this is where is peace, and this is the beginning of working with seals. When I moved from military police to SEALs, I thought the situation's so peace. There's nothing but when I work with SEALs and heading target and I saw all the demolition, we talk about it. And this is kind of make me not feel, well, I feel, I didn't feel right about myself. I didn't like fuck me those people came thousand mile to clean my city and i am here and i don't know anything about it and this is give me motivation to start develop my language my skills everything do you remember when we talk about it and see as they start teaching me this and that weapon all the fucking watching driving and part part of that don't trust anyone outside your team and consider everything red flag unless prove it opposite and this is what happened with me. I'm driving from my house. My house is away from the airport and also like 20 minutes away. I'm driving my car. I have Opel, German car. And always I push my chair to the end. And there's like, you know, the middle between the two windows mm -hmm. to cover my face. Again, at that time, there is no assassination there is no attack so far nothing so i'm driving my car and i saw on the mirror i control all the mirror to cover everything there is two guy one of them he have long beard which is we call him imam like a priest he's driving the car this is first red flag and the guy sitting next to him, he's a teenager, 18, 19, 20 years. Supposedly he driving and this guy, because the religion... In normal circumstances, the young man should be driving the older man. The old, and he is a priest, imam. So this is another reason, you know what I mean? Right. So this is red flags. When I saw that, it's like, oh. But again, there's, 
no anti-activity. So you have to pick up which way to feel safe and jackass and take it serious. So I took it serious as a red flag. So I drive, I took right, they took right after me. And I took left, they took left. So it's kind of confirm red flag. So I put my quick flag plan and that's why when we, when we talk about flexibility to build decision through the, your environment do you remember when we had the target and we saw shoes mm -hmm. and we change it hey we don't have enough time to explain to them hey change the plan let's hit this building and we had it and if we had that family building maybe those terrorists they can kill us and the family and they blame the American killed. So anyway, so my plan is the road is going to be end soon and we have to take right for 200 meters and the road is going to be dirt. So my plan is to take that road. Soon I took it. I'm going to drive slow. When I took right to the dirt road, I'm going to push the gas hard. And when they pass me, if they pass me and they want to do something, I'm going to push the brake. So surprise element in my hand and confuse them. If they don't pass me, if they pass me and they go, everyone happy. No one lose anything. So I did push the gas and I saw him. He want to pass me too. And he passed, almost when I passed me, I pushed the brake and I saw the guy with 90 millimeters pistol. He shot me one round. And he had the middle. The pillar. Between Dead. the two windows, yeah. Yeah, the pillar. And like I told you, I stop. I push the brake. I stop completely. I have AK-47, 75 round. So I put bullet and open the door. And the guy... When to the end of the road, he have to take left or right. He take left, which is jackass. He gave me like clear shot. I shot the driver and while I walk, I shot him. So I killed both of them and I threw my ID. And the reason why I threw my ID is because I know those guys, they have intelligence and they can pass the news. Hey, those guys who's killed, uh, the ID, we find it, I uh, threw it outside. Uh, it's Riyadh Khalif, which is my name. And I disconnect the engine hose gas and I burn the car. And the information went back to both sides, to the Iraqi government, through the, to the Americans, and to the Qaeda. So they thought they killed me. And this is kind of give me enough time to move my family to another place. I went to the base and Captain Steve, uh, LT Steve in that time, he says, hey, Johnny, you have to be very careful. It's like, for what? He says, they killed interpreter, his name, Riyadh Khalif. Because the police station reported and they found the ID and they reported to the uh, headquarters of the police station, the headquarters reported to the military police, military police to the base, and part of them to the intelligence to the SEALs. And he don't know, I am the one who's killed them. So this is kind of the environment in that time. And the thing how is start getting change from friendly environment to anti-environment. We can discuss about reasons why, but well, I can blame the American politic. They don't have a plan after, and they ignore all the fucking American soldier sacrifice for that, and Iraqi innocent sacrifice for that too. But that is just one example of how it, it definitely started getting worse for your family. Um, and in the book, the, you talk, I mean, you, your wife is an amazing woman and, and what she went through 
And there was a point where it, there's a story where the Mujahideen were coming and looking for you. And basically, I think it was your wife and your sister-in-law were at the, like pressing up against the door, like we're not going to let them in. And if they're, and if they come in, we're fighting them. Yeah. And, and so your family got to a point where they were sacrificing so much. And then you got to the point where you had to take taxi cabs and, and walk the wrong way. And, and, you know, just to get from your house to the base and what I'm getting to is, was there ever that point for you not to quit, but just to say, I, I want to fight for my country, but by doing this, I'm putting my family in too much harm. So what, what, what has happened? After they tried to kill me, I told my family, we have like kind of meeting, hey, this is what's going on. So I moved my wife and my kids from my family and I start move them every two, three weeks from neighbor to neighbor. You know, most of this big city is not bigger than big, but it's big city. Right. You can uh, make the guide intelligent, lose your track. And for me, I moved to Baghdad with the SEAL team, SEAL team five, I think. So it's not safe for my family, but it's better than if they stay in a known place. And what they do, they announce, after they put my name in the mask, I am enemy of Islam, this and that. They say, oh, he's run away to Syria and we are uh, not anymore talk to him. He's not part of the family. He's out from our life and forgive us. And that would be enough for them to leave it's your family? It's not enough, but this is one of the things make them cool down while my wife and the kids, they go from places to places to lose the truck. Got it. They end up with moving to Baghdad. And Baghdad is way bigger and you can mix easy and you can, they can lose your truck completely if you are smart. Same thing here with the drug dealer. Right. If he... He sell for 5000 and he went to bar and he talk about his or talk his girlfriend or whatever. You know the deal. So anyway, but back to what you mentioned about our women in general, they are the real hero. We are only tools. Me, you. We born as men to protect our family, but when this role move to your wife this is way huge than you and you will never handle it we talk again i love to connect th pieces me and you if we had mission and we had ambush facing death starving we can handle it but if our kids with us we will struggle we will make wrong decision how about my wife Facing death, she had no weapon, no power, only her love and faith. And sometime her wish became is, God, if something happened, please let him kill me first before they kill my kids. We, as men, and sorry, I'm going to disappoint all the men. We are fucking pussies compared to our wives, Very our true. wives, they handle all the pressure in every database daily. And we just complain about everything. I just want to mention that. No, I agree with you 100%. And, and that brings me to, you made the decision, you were going to come to the country, you talk about how to kind of kick things in gear, but it was a slow process. And in the book, it, it talks about the, the back and forth and all of the problems that it, that arose trying to get you here. But ultimately it took two years, I believe three years. Um, you came here in July of 2009. Correct. Correct. Talk to me uh, about what it was like getting on that plane or get, how about 
the nervousness leading up to and then getting on that plane and coming here? Okay, again, before that, I don't know, maybe I have PTSD. I avoid all your questions <laughs> to another question. No, that's okay. Yeah, so. And, and I want to go back to the beginning, and I'm trying to hit on stories that are great in the book, but at the same token, I want people to still go read the book. It's, it's of, course. A, of course. And I try to and mention more details is not a mission in the book. So anyway, but before we move to the airplane, before we, I told my wife, but I didn't tell her when. I didn't tell my kids. Four o'clock in the morning next day, it's gonna be an armored vehicle came to my house in civilian neighborhood in Baghdad to escort me and my family to the Baghdad airport. I am not exaggerate. If I says I, me and my family, the most protected people in the world in all the SEALs history, how much SEALs came how much vehicle? I don't know, maybe fucking big gun too. <laughs> it's huge. So anyway, told her 12 o'clock we slept and I just told her, prepare the passport just in case if they want. Four o'clock we come up and hey, uh, do we have the backpack? Always we have ready. They says, yes. She, I told her, hey, we live in the United States. What? So we went, the armored vehicle in front of the house, they pulled, they secured the neighbor. We went inside, we took, and it's early morning, but still there's people walk, and just they just like, what the fuck is going on? This is like, yeah, president of the United States? Did something. they think you were being kidnapped or something? No, 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 because the armor is American. Oh, okay. And they thought maybe president of the United States or something. <laughs> we went to the airport. We didn't stop at the checkpoint. They dropped us. And there's other team with civilian clothes. And the worst part in SEALs mission, when they move from hunter to hunted, from tracking bad guys to be open target. They act so weird. You will see them like, they just like <laughs> turn around. <laughs> so I went and there is like legit reason why they want to bring like enough security because we don't trust the Iraqi customs because they connect with Iranian. Right. And for all the information I have, it's going to change a lot of politic powers for me i will never say anything classified but i'm human and they're torturing or using my kids if i am start getting telling classified info it's gonna affect united states so bad so anyway we went and is one-way ticket same thing when I went to the airport. Do you remember one-way ticket? Yes. Walking to get the job. To get the job. Same thing. It's one-way ticket. We wait, We passed the costume. Everything good. And we wait. And my kids, they have no idea. And start telling them, hey, we go into Jordan. And from Jordan, we go into United States. And your kids at this, because you've got four children, how old, how old are they at this time? So I think three, Mustafa, he is, I think eight, seven, I'm not good with age. Yeah, 14, 18 and 20, I think. Yeah, I'm horrible with age. All the time I ask my wife assistant. So, you, so you've got two older ones who can really understand what's going on. You got two younger ones yeah. that don't really know. That's why I told you, Nina, 
because she is under pressure when she cannot be proud about her father and all what she hear bad things about me. He's a traitor, he's enemy of Islam. And imagine you are enemy of Islam in a Muslim country. So anyway, so we went to the Jordanian airplane. The same fucking airplane I catch jackpot from it three weeks ago. <laughs> so, you know, we're tracking the phone and we don't have this encryption. They say it's a blunt. I told the motherfucker, we don't have fucking a blunt. The description of the guy, like he's blunt here, this and that, the blue eyes. We don't have <laughs> But if we have, this going to be IPO. Did you get a surfer who got lost in Iraq <laughs> or something? <laughs> so we went and, uh, you know, the, we call it the Game Boy. The guy was tracking in that time is fucking, we use like antique tracking device. We called it Game Boy. He track and he says he's on this airplane. So we went inside. We don't know his name. We know Abu Fatima. Fatima's father. And we know his family with him. So we went and, you know, he cannot use the tracking device in front of everyone because it's classified in that time. So it's like, we have to do something. So I went inside the airplane and he's behind me with civilian clothes. And I saw like child, like six years old. I told her, hey, Fatima, how are you? She says, I'm good. So I told him jackpot. So we took him and they want to take him out, the Jordanian security, because it's Jordanian airplane. He said, you cannot take him. It's like, why? He says, because this is a Jordanian property. I told him, yeah, you land in my fucking country, motherfucker. Move your fucking ass. So we moved him and we take him and he's the right jackpot. So it's three weeks away, ago. We just capture a guy. But it's like, what is going to happen? I know Jordanian, they have good relationship with the United States. I'm safe. So I'm sitting. We left everything behind. There is no plan to go back. No plan. And start taking off. At the beginning, they say there is dust storm. We will see. It's like, fuck. No, no. We have to go. We have to go. So they start taking off, but the way how they're taking off, they do loop to reach Pacific High, so away from uh, from mortars, from any anti bullshit things attack. And after that, they start flying. They start like going uh, straight. So when they do that, there is dust storm, and we saw it, we saw nothing beside like dust. Told Beda, I told her, I'm not going back again. I'm done. And in, in a few seconds, I bring all my life together. It looked like all what I did for this second. All what I did, I look at to my kids. I look at to my love of my life. All this life, it's so, so awesome how the brain works. It's like work the screen in the front of me and bring everything together. We land in Jordan. We stay one day and next day, still, I don't believe it. We flew from Jordan to Chicago and I think it's 16 hours or something. We never flew an airplane in our life, except me, C-130, we use it for military mission purposes but like you said as human respectful and cheer and food all the, we don't used to i took two pills i took it from the seal sleeping pills i woke up like 45 minutes away from the airport <laughs> <laughs> sometime we need to be selfish and they will come as the organization and they took us to the hotel I pulled my uh, Johnny Walker, red label, uh, drink a couple shots. First time in my life, I have no weapon. First time in my life, I'm not sh shaking. Do you prefer Johnny Walker red? I'm sorry. Just is that, is yeah. that, 
I don't know, because I used to drink it. And I used to make money from it. So, so anyway, it's like Mustafa, my youngest son. Hey, let's go. It's like, okay. I have no idea where we're going. I'm kind of a little bit buzzed. I took him with me and walked at the street. And they saw like big ass sign, Target. And people, they go back and forth. So I went, I went inside. A, you know, like when you take kids to candy store or not candy store, candy city. Right. It's like, just like open your eyes, screening everything. And it's so unique feeling. And this is message to, to all the audience, to all the Americans. Enjoy the gift while you have it, which is the safety provided by our law enforcement. It's so important. I never walk with my son in public until I came to the United States. We went to the Target. I bought three X large shirt. I never wear it, wear it just to feel I'm human, just to talk with my son and feel it. It's so awesome. Sometimes people, they ask me, are you rich? I'm fucking richest motherfucker because I'm healthy and I'm safe. And this kind of things, we need to focus on it. You mentioned earlier um, the incident involving the hookers and the pimp and and the importance of of defending your name and your tribe when he started talking about your family. Has there ever been a point where you've missed the family that you're away from by being here? So one year ago, I, I, I don't know if you know or not, but I'm not allowed to go to my country. Not from the United States, there's some concern, but from the Iraqi government. They put my name in red list, blacklist, which is I don't give a shit. So I went back to Turkey, beautiful country, cheap. And from Turkey, I went to north of Iraq, which is, you know, Kurdish, they love us. And from there, I smuggled to my city. The country I fought for, sacrifice, I lost my brother for it, and half of my tribe, the country who's run by stranger, trader, they don't let me go to my city. So it's like, fuck them. So I smuggle, and they went there. I spent maybe 12 hours, everything changed. And it's weird feeling for the first time. I remember the team guys when they uh, ready to go home and they says, home sweet home. I never felt it when they, uh, when they say it was like, it's not touching my heart or my understanding because we don't have home. And as you know, the definition of home is roof cover you and your family, food, and dignity. We don't have those three things. So I don't have home. But in my city where I born and raised, Mosul, I felt I need home, sweet home. I want to go back to the United States. And I left it. I couldn't say anymore. Because in the book you mentioned that your plan was to never go back. No. Um, in, in the book, you, you talk about your mother passed away yeah. shortly after being here. And, and so you weren't able to be there for, no, I for that. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, this is a country of immigrants. Everybody here, nobody is from here. Everybody, you know, um, myself included, my family's, you know, came here from Italy and Europe. And, and so where I'm going with this is I'm glad for you that you had the opportunity to go back and 
affirm that you made the right decision to leave. I'm sad that for you, because none of us will ever, those of us who grew up here in the United States have, have ever experienced war right outside our front door. None of us have ever experienced an invading force from another country coming into our, you know, and, and taking over our country. I just object about invade. I'm not talking, I'm, I'm not referring to when the U.S. came in to help you liberate. It, I'm just talking about just war in general. And, but you stayed in that fight to try to make, or what you thought would make Iraq better. And at, at some point in time, you had to say, I can't keep doing this to my family. It's becoming too dangerous to my family. We have to leave. And then you did get the opportunity to go back and say, I didn't make a mistake. I made the right decision to leave, if that makes sense. Makes sense. From day one, when I work with Americans, I know I make the right decision. And that's make me feel I pick up the right decision. Every mission, every time we catch savages, bad guys, terrorists, and start to get them, start talking to them, find the evidence, report, the letters, cell phones, explosion, I know I make the right decision. People, they use advantage by dividing people and religion and color and race, same thing in Iraq. They consider American forces infidel. They want to take over Iraq. They want to destroy Islam. I didn't think like them because this is like short vision. I think about American. They are on the right side against people on the wrong side, no matter who's those people, no matter who's those people. I didn't look at to the color, skin, or religion as much as I look at to the purpose and the morals motivate the, them. And that's why from day one until now, I have no regret whatsoever about any decision I make through working with American forces. Maybe, except sometime I feel I should give it more because I have more knowledge now, but this is not regret. For the immigrant, before I, I want to talk about the immigrant and my concern, I want to just go back to one of the mission I told you about it. You love it. So one time, we had mission during the day. And as you know, during the day, you can be easy target. You know, we use breach, we use fast rope, we use whatever at the night, surprise element. We run the show. At the day, you run shit. But, Again, discipline. So the job is ranger. We're having biggest mosque in the Baghdad. So the ranger, they can uh, surrounding, clear the fence, seals, team, they can uh, clear all the building inside, Delta Force, they came and find the jackpot. So everyone did his part, ranger, seal, and the part came to Delta Force and it's taken like kind of long time. Smoking that time, I told the chief, hey brother, what's going on? He says, Johnny, they tried to find the jackpot. It's like, what the fuck, take him a long time. Tell him I can't fucking find it in 10 minutes. I just want to go back and fucking start drinking my room <laughs> because I started acting weird. I never fucking had mission at the, at the day. So pass it to the radio and they says, yeah, bring him in. So I went, you know, I'm with my fucking M4, with my gammies, with, what is the term? Tell him me. Or Johnny is like, yeah. So I told him, listen, you want jackpot. 
whatever I do is not your fucking business. You want jackpot from me within 15 minutes, I will give it to you. Soon we start the time, I will give it to you. But what I do during that, it's not fucking your business. It's like, okay. So I pull him out and I bring the seals. We capture almost like 30 guys. I don't know how many. It's more than 15, 20 guys. So I told him I want to put him in one line, all of them. Because they track the phone, they found the phone, but they don't to know belong to who, and they know his name, Abu Sajjad. This means Sajjad's father. So we put him on the line. I put two seals behind the building, two seals behind them, and me and other two seals in the front. So I came and I talked to the to the all the Iraqis. You know, they have SSC back. And of course, we zip tied them. And I told him, hey, I present the Iraqi government. And when we um, clear the buildings, all the mosques, you know, we cleared very carefully. We find nothing. And you know, if I came to your house and you are a drug dealer, and you know what's in your house. And if I told you I found half tons of coke or fentanyl, it's like, fuck you, bullshit. This is give you false feeling of safety. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I play in this, in this gap. So I told him, hey, the source came with us. He says, you guys have car palms, explosion. And I look at the faces, all of them, and I smile. They know that's nothing. So this is part one of my plan work good. I apologize. And as to prove it, we have nothing against you and good attention. We can cut the zip tight, but please don't do anything unless we leave. And in the meantime, I'm going to start calling your guy's name. And every time I call someone, please let him come to me. I'm going to give him a gift, which is $200, and apology. Oh, th- th- thank you, this and that. I didn't let my feeling judge. I look at the faces who is involved because if you are a professional, you have to separate your feeling from the facts. So I told him, okay, I announce one, two, three names and I give him money. I collect the money from team. <laughs> and when he go behind the building, the two seals, they capture him again. Because it's 50-50. Right. Well, this is the only option we have. So I reached to, I think, seven, eight names. And I mentioned, I was a jet. So he just moved one step to the front, to the jackpot. So we brought him in, we give him to Delta. And within 15 minutes, we start exfilled. And we went back to the base. And the chief, he says, uh, supposedly to go to the debrief. And you know, I'm, I find it, you know. Maybe I'm going to have fucking gift or something. Which is bottle of Johnny Walker or something. They say, Johnny, you don't need to come to debrief. It's like, okay, fuck it. Go into my room. Start drink. And watch some magic uh, show. Sitting in my room, drinking. And Chief came and he says, Johnny, how long have you been... Here on the base, it's like, oh, three months. Supposedly, I, every six months, I go visit my family. He says, you want to go to visit your family? It's like, oh, shit. You remember we talk about red flag? First, no debrief. You don't need to be. I am the main one. Second, he asked me to go visit my home. It's like, okay, let me play the same game. Yeah, I want to go, but I don't have money. He said, don't worry, we will cover your expenses. It's like 1000 I live like fucking Sultan. 
how much enough for you? I told him 5,000. He said, okay, done. <laughs> Holy shit. I should say it's 10,000. <laughs> when I say it's 5,000, it's like way away. Within 10 minutes, you bring 5,000 and you give it to me. It's like, okay, I have to call the driver. I need someone to drop me at the, at the gate. So, okay, done. I went, went home, fucking start like, live like king, you know, like fucking whatever they buy, everything. Yeah. But still, I'm inside the house. Yeah, you're, this you're a prisoner in the house. Yeah. But my mom happy, my brothers. So before my brother who's killed by Kaida, uh, he loved tools, he's mechanic, give him money. So anyway, I make, I, I build some smile in each one of my family. Supposedly one week and head back. One week and there's nothing. And I called them, hey guys, do you want me to be back? They said, no, 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 you're good. You need anything? I told them, yeah, I need money. It's like, okay, we will send it to you. Fuck. <laughs> so anyway, long story short, I head back to the base after three weeks. And they says, Johnny, this is what happened. We know you fucking charge us a lot, motherfucker. But we have to do that to protect you. It's like, what are you talking about? He says, the Delta Force, they says, you take all our seven turb. And this is not request. This is fucking order. You know, fucking Delta, they have all the access. We want Johnny Walker with us. <laughs> and that's why we have to escape you. And we told him you are resigned. <laughs> They were watching out for you. Yeah. Um, same thing with me. You know, I watch, watch for them. So. Immigrant. All the way back to the very beginning, your book, Codename Johnny Walker. Did you have any input in the nickname Johnny Walker or was it just given to you? It's not input. Sometimes um, I want, you want, but sometimes someone else he moved the pieces. So one time, supposedly we have mission. So three o'clock, we have target, five o'clock target meeting. And this is mission canceled because big storm coming 100%. We have, we are not going because we lose the bird to watching us. So it's like fucking body time. Motherfuckers, I want to drink. Wake up in the morning, go have a breakfast, live like fucking human, like, not like fucking Batman. Only at the night. <laughs> so I went back and they have gallon of Johnny Walker and I drink all of it. All of it. Wow. <laughs> all of it. Wow. I will send you one of my link with uh, Mike Rutland. One of my interview, his team guy, awesome team guy. He's, he's, he's hero. I drink, I think bottle of, what do you call it? Not the whiskey. Bourbon? Bourbon. While we had the interview. <laughs> <laughs> bottle. So anyway, so I slept, of course, and the bottle with me. And they came and they said, mission. The storm is clear. There's nothing. And they says, Walker, he's sleepy with the, the gallon of Johnny Walker. They says, okay, his name fucking Johnny Walker now. <laughs> I love it. Now in my house, my wife called me Johnny, my kids, sometimes they call me Johnny, sometimes they call me my real name. But I love this name. I, If you look at it, it's funny. But, but I build it with the blood. I mean, I pay a lot for this name. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I quit a drink three years ago. Oh. Clean, 100%. And this is... Uh, By choice or necessity? Not this or not that. I went for SEAL program. We took uh, Abu Gain and DMT-5 for three days in Mexico. And they had back losing desire of any drink. Mm. And I recommend it to the all law enforcement. When they get retired, they need it. Did, it, did you feel it helped you a lot? Wow. I mean, just imagine Johnny Walker. Now he's Johnny Water. <laughs> from wake up every day for five o'clock in the morning drink bottle of scotch 
to lost the desire. And, you know, we talk a lot about family, how much important to us. And we did what we did for them, for ourselves, for our dream, our path, destiny. But also, I start not, I love them. But I start getting angry with them, not feeling them. So when I went for that journey, healing journey, and they head back, I start find excuses to them. Listen to them. Feel love. I have better relationship with my family, with my wife. Kind of struggle a little bit with, with her. This is fucking to bring me back where I should be. Wow. Yeah. We'll definitely have to do a round two and we'll get more into that. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate your time, sir. It was, it was amazing to get to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank you again. And appreciate that. And I just want to mention about immigrant if you have time. Please, please. Yeah. So as we talk about, I fought for American dream. I don't know if this is going to make people call me racist, whatever. I don't give a shit. It's time to tell the truth, right? I didn't fight for Arabic dream. I didn't fight for white dream, white dream, black, Asian dream. I fought for American dream. And what happened, and this is one of the reasons I'm trying to move from San Diego to Texas or some place where I can find my American dream, is a lot of immigrant. And no one get me wrong, I am immigrant too. I'm not against myself. This is, make no sense. But I am against immigrant who came with a fraud. He came with wrong culture. And uh, again, I'm not judging them. Because I know they came with no option. Like for Iraqi people, Syrian people, Afghani people, Asian people, they came from country, they been slave for hundred years underneath name of God, name of uh, race, whatever. And like we mentioned, our leaders, they took home feeling from our heart. So when they came here, they don't feel they have home. They already lost it. So no matter how much assistance they came and if they found way to fraud it, they will fraud it. So they killed the culture, the American culture. And that's why I'm trying to move from Cali. I just want to go where I can find the things I find for it, which is American dream. Well, I wish you the best. I hope that you find you. what it works for you and what works for your family. Um, obviously you're, you're very closely connected to a recent immigration to this country and all that you gave before you even got here. I can imagine that once you're here, you want everybody to be giving as much of themselves as they can. So it's gotta be hard to see it when people don't. It's worth it. I mean, look at to me, I'm not talking about someone else. They give us respect, love, everything we need. So we have to pay them back in the same way. You know what I mean? And also, I want to just send a message to, to our law enforcement. I mean, thank you so much for make me, me and my family feeling safe. Thank you so much for not letting me feel I need to carry my weapons and face the ugly human inside us. I appreciate all the sacrifice. And for anyone who's want to defend the police, I'm going to tell him, if you, if you want to defend the police, this is punishment, this is no solution. Before you make that decision, just go live in Afghanistan or Iraq for a couple months and see if you can change your mind or not. 
How can people get in touch with you? Uh, through social media, Johnny Walker. Oh, so it, I think on Instagram, it's code name Johnny Walker. Code name Johnny Walker. And then uh, Johnny Walker on Facebook. And on Facebook. Yeah. Again, thank you for your time, sir. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I wish you the best luck. And enjoy Temakula time. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate you watching, but before you go, if you like the video, please hit that subscribe button. Also, any comments are appreciated. Thank you.